Welcome to the Terrible Podcast with your host from SteelersDepot.com, where you can find all your latest and greatest Steelers news. It's Dave Bryan and Alex Kazora, always lit, talking Steelers. And now, here's Dave and Alex. Welcome to the Terrible Podcast, Season 15, Episode 31. He's Dave Bryan. I'm Alex Kazora, SteelersDepot.com. Thanks for being back with us this Monday, Steelers Nation. And Dave, you can put that champagne away. The Pittsburgh Steelers will not go undefeated. They have suffered their first loss of the 2024 season, falling in upset fashion to the Indianapolis Colts on Sunday, 27 to. 24. A lot to talk about in this one. We'll start here with some breaking news, though, on James Daniels. Steelers starting right guard. No longer the starting right guard. He is out for the season due to a torn Achilles, according to ESPN's Jeremy Fowler. So just want to start that up front. Just broke here about 10 a.m. Eastern Time Monday. So not exactly an ideal way to start the week off here for Pittsburgh, but it's where they're at. Boom, despair. No. No. Agony on me. Oh, Don't you do that. Deep, dark depression, excessive misery. Oh, ah, didn't think, uh, didn't think you'd be breaking into that on this Monday morning, but here we are. And boy, you get the, uh, get the news first thing about the James Daniels uh, injury. And you, you knew that, uh, when he left the game early, that, you know, especially after the game too, when it was on crutches and I guess what in a boot and all that probably going to miss some time. And you just hope that it wasn't, you know, any kind of season ending injury, but here we are and sucks for him, man. Uh, for sure. Because you got a guy that, uh, was looking, you know, to, uh, to hit free agency after the season and get one of those, Nice uh, guard tax uh, paychecks, you would think, still at a very young age. And now there's going to be, you know, obviously you should be able to recover from this, you would think, but uh, pretty lengthy recovery time and probably going to obviously hurt his uh, free agent market value come time for that. And obviously a huge blow to the Steelers offensive line, been arguably the uh, the uh, the best one of uh, the group so far through the first uh, through the start of the season here. So uh, this team went for a long time with kind of avoiding offensive line injuries, and they're certainly not avoiding that this year, are they? No, the O-line injury luck, as I wrote, after the Fawatanu injury has run out, and it has really run out after the Daniels injuries of Pittsburgh will essentially never have their starting five, whatever configuration you may have projected it to be before week one, uh, playing together this year. And just as Isaac say, Malu seems poised to return for the Cowboys game, which is, of course, fantastic news for a team that needs, say, Malu. They need him all the more after Daniels going down. That was my first thought when, once I heard the news from Fowler this morning, Dave, was not even about the team, but about him, because I knew he was having a great year. He was a free agent to be. The guard market, like you said, has gotten red hot. He could have gotten $16, $17, 20000000 million per year on the open market, even though he was unlikely to return to Pittsburgh for that reason. And now his market obviously has been impacted. He'll have to fight to get ready for week one next year. And what team will be doing that for? I couldn't tell you right now. Yeah, well, uh, we'll have to definitely wait and see how that all plays out. But uh, in the here and now, it will be interesting to see how the Steelers uh, move past this with configurations. Uh, Isaac Sayamalo, who has uh, missed the first four games, uh, I think the speculation is, is that they'll get him back uh, for this week five Sunday night game against the uh, Dallas Cowboys. And uh, with losing James Daniels, it does, you know, and you did start Mason, Mason McCormick at left guard. Mason McCormick coming out of college played well over 3,000 snaps at left guard, not even 20. I think the total was 19 at right guard. This team has obviously used Spencer Anderson at both left guard and right guard. I don't know what they're going to do here, but my initial thought was maybe you leave Mason McCormick at left guard and flip Isaac Sayamalo over to right guard, assuming he's able to return. 
Isaac Sayamalo has logged uh, quite a bit of time at, at right guard in the NFL. And obviously Mason McCormick uh, being a rookie, you would, you would think that, you know, you want to try to keep them as natural as possible, but that's not in the Steelers. <laughs> that's also true. Right? <laughs> the Steelers uh, don't care what, what side you played. Uh, 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 they, they, they're, they're not into all that, are they? But uh, we'll, we'll have to wait and see how they configured this now going forward. But, you know, Mason McCormick does have all that college experience at left guard and, you know, with say Amalo having the experience at right guard in the NFL, that was my initial thought. But, uh, and then, you know, obviously Spencer Anderson can play all, you know, all spots along the offensive line. God forbid you get to that point and you could use him as a swing, whatever, if you wanted to, but, uh, huge, long story short, this is a huge blow to the offensive line and an offensive line that's, you know, struggled to find, any continuity and any consistency on a down by down basis through the first four games. It is. And it's just unfortunate for a team banking on its offensive line being strength of the unit and, you know, investing so heavily in that only to have it wither away. And you have Nate Herbig out for the year, Troy Fawtani out for the regular season with only the slight possibility of a playoff return. And now James Daniels out for the year on top of that. Say Malu missing the first month. Dylan Cook missing at least the first month of potentially counting. And Broderick Jones playing through the injuries he's played through. So, and we're only in uh, week number four here, just getting out of week number four. But Dave, we'll talk about that a little bit more throughout, I'm sure, today's show. And on Wednesday, once we hear a little bit more from Mike Tomlin during his Tuesday press conference, let's do some of the housekeeping in this one before we get into this loss. Again, 27-24 loss to the Colts on Sunday dropping Pittsburgh to 3-1 and one on the season. From an in-game injury standpoint, besides Daniels, uh, Cordero Patterson hurt his ankle, don't know his status. That was a big blow. He was his team's best runner in this game, having success in that first half before going down. From an inactive standpoint, thought pretty curious roster construction overall in this one, dressing only four wide receivers, only three edge guys, 11 DBs. They elevated running back Aaron Champlin and cornerback Thomas Graham Jr. Ahead of this game, of course, both men both dressed in this one. Roman Wilson continues to be inactive. Darius Rush, the uh, other healthy scratch in this one. Yeah, I have to wait at least yet another week for uh, Roman Wilson to make his NFL debut. I thought, you know, uh, like last week, I thought there was a decent chance that, uh, and, and mainly because of the, you know, you had you know, uh, basically five guys uh, we're, we're going to miss this game or four guys injured and the same old, same old with, uh, with Russell Wilson. So that left, uh, two spots that needed to be filled. And obviously the elevations, uh, took place, uh, uh how they did and, uh, was a little bit surprised. Thomas Graham was one of them. We, we had both agreed that there'd probably be a, a, a running back elevated kind of thought that might be Jonathan Ward, but ended up being Champlin. Uh, but once those two guys got elevated, Graham and Champlin on Saturday, you had an idea that those two guys were going to dress. Uh, was unsure whether or not Terrell Edmonds would get a helmet for this, but he got his first helmet uh, uh, as a rejoiner uh, of the Steelers on on Sunday. And the thing about Thomas Graham is he only played four snaps on special teams. He didn't play any snaps on defense. Uh, and... Edmonds did play eight snaps on defense in this one. And as you stated, no kind of wondered if they would elevate an, uh, another outside linebacker uh, for this game. And they obviously didn't uh, go that route. So interesting kind of pregame movements, if you will. But uh, none of those, I don't think, went <laughs> in, in determining the game. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. No, they didn't. And by the way, I am done predicting when Roman Wilson will dress. I'm over too. So I'm going to just stop and we'll wait and see because his team clearly is comfortable dressing for even with Patterson being the number two running back in this game because Jalen Warren did not play along with some other injured players, Alex Highsmith, Michael Pruitt, Russell Wilson continued to serve as that emergency third string quarterback and one of the teams inactive. So all right, Dave, let's just jump into this game. Again, 27-24 loss, a very sloppy game for the Pittsburgh Steelers. 
They are a team that if they lose a turnover battle to to nothing, they're not going to win the game. That's just simply, I think, how it how it boils down to. And frankly, they still could have won that game uh, despite uh, all, all the adversity. It, it it almost had a playoff game feel in the sense of Pittsburgh digs himself a big hole early, comes out pretty flat, and then has to climb back and falls just short. So despite all the negativity, Pittsburgh would let that one final drive, and then of course the botched, unexpected snap, whatever you want to call it, from Frazier to Fields, of which Fields took the blame for post game when Pittsburgh was driving about 20 yards outside field goal range, doomed them. So that play kind of summed up the game, just sloppy Steelers hurting themselves, losing the game. Boy, the negative plays were just too negative <laughs> to uh, uh, to uh, to overcome uh, in this one. And man, you had the uh, George Pickens fumbled deep down in 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 Colts territory. How crucial was uh, was that? You had uh, the team driving get a get get a silly penalty. You could probably even call that on on both Broderick Jones and Spencer Anderson, right? Mm-hmm. Take your pick. Uh, uh, take your pick. Who you wanted to give that uh, uh, on? Uh, you obviously had the, uh, uh, the, 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 the fields play and, and the fumble and making a bad play even worse by, uh, turning the football over in that situation. And, uh, you even get into a, a, after all that, you get yourself in a, you're, you're still in a situation to, I thought, I thought they're going to win the game. I, I I'm just going to come right out and say it. I, I, I thought, I thought. That uh, they were going to get it done on that final drive, uh, maybe just blind optimism or whatnot. But they had been moving the ball uh, pretty decent decently. They had been taking advantage of Justin Fields' legs uh, uh, at the very least, get in field goal range uh, with that. And then you know you have that uh, yet another aborted snap uh, situation there. And man, we could probably spend fifteen minutes breaking that down, but. Uh, it was interesting to hear the uh, pre post game comments on that and Frazier saying I was tapped, but I was making line calls at the time and uh, eventually snapped the football. And then Justin Fields saying, look, it was after one leg kick. I gave the leg kick and McCormick tapped uh, Frazier and then McCormick even turned around and said, you know, like what's going on. Then that's when Frazier snapped the football and, uh, field said he was trying to, at that time, take one last look and see it, see what the, what the rotation picture looked like. And, uh, just a mess that, that kind of stuff is just happening way too much. Uh, who, whoever you want to put the blame on, I, I sort of feel like it's more on fields to be honest with you. Now that we have kind of the all 22 and all the comments, uh, 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 in on this, but, uh, regardless you know, key situation in the game, got to have it type situation. And, and you have yet another center quarterback, you know, miscue on that, but the negative was just too much, too much negative to overcome. And yeah, I think these te- these two teams balanced out in explosive plays uh, all together here. I think it was, let's see one, two, three, four, five to five overall, you throw in the two O loss on the turnover battle and you get a top stat of plus two and you know what what does history show 80 percent of the times if, if you win the tox battle by two or more you're going to win the ball game and 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 you know that 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 that's what ultimately happened here that is the dating back to the preseason the eighth messy snap bot snap whatever you want to call it that pittsburgh has had with justin fields and I really, I think Zach Frazier, maybe one of those was with McCollum in the preseason. Um, they've only been clean, 100% clean on their snaps in the regular season once this year, and that was last week against the Chargers. So I know that playing three of the four, first four on the road is tough, especially with this really young interior offensive line, especially in this Colts game when you lose Daniels and your interior line was McCormick, a rookie, Frazier, a rookie, Anderson, a second-year guy, but no excuse. This team has to be able to do the most basic thing in football, which is snap the football. And they're struggling to do that and be on the right page and same page. I've yet to see the all 22, but essentially my understanding from what Fields had said, and you can probably ask what color here too, Dave, is that obviously they're working on a silent count. And so Fields, you know, kicks his leg. McCormick looks back, sees it. 
taps Frazier, and at that point, the ball can be snapped at really any point. And then Fields is looking at the coverage, takes his eyes off the snap, Frazier snaps it, and that's when disaster struck. Mm. Is that essentially what happened? Yeah, yeah, because uh, didn't Fields say it's supposed to be after the first leg kick? Uh, in that on that particular play mm-hmm. and he gave the leg kick and uh, McCormick tapped Frazier and Frazier was finishing out uh, line calls according to him and then snapped the football and I guess Justin thought he'd take the opportunity to take one last look and he's got to be ready for the and he even said he took you know he took he, he took ownership of it I got to be ready for for whenever that ball is snapped in that situation yeah, so that one, you know, because Pittsburgh had what first and ten at I think their own forty-two, and they're about twenty yards away. I, I I wasn't in mode of they're going to win this game, but I was in a rare confident mode of okay, they're going to get in range for Boswell to hit this thing, take it to overtime, and we'll see what happens. And obviously, it all went you know awry from there. Yeah, it's hard to overcome that. And then the, what was the next play? Uh, the pass over to Najee, and he didn't get out of bounds. It just it it it, it just you know. Uh, It was hard to overcome that snap for sure. Let's look at the Steelers offense and another slow start in this one. They've only scored 10 points in the first quarter all season. They were down 17, nothing in this one. Didn't get on the scoreboard until what late in the first half with that Boswell 50 yard field goal. Let's start with the play of Justin Fields overall. You know, you saw some of the negativity that you hadn't seen too often this year. You mentioned the 20 yard sack turned into a forced fumble. I think you said it well, of making a bad situation worse. How would you evaluate his overall play in this game? Yeah, it's a shame you can't just throw out those uh, uh, those two hugely negative plays. I thought he played. I thought he made good decisions overall and played within the offense once again. Uh, like the use of his uh, use him using his legs. Obviously, had two uh, 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 rushing touchdowns in this game. I uh, thought he made some nice throws overall. Uh, there were opportunities where he, uh, you could you could see that he thought twice about maybe going down the field and dumping it off. And uh, I thought those were overall good decisions. I I thought he played well overall. Bar you know t- taking away, you know unfortunately you can't do that. But uh, those those two hugely negative plays. Uh, but I, I, you know, I, I thought he, I thought he was going to do enough, definitely to win this game, uh, overall. So, I mean, look, if you look at it from, you know, just a raw passing yardage, uh, standpoint, and you know, he didn't throw any interceptions in this game. Uh, thought he put the ball where it needed to go most of the time in this game. I, I, I gave him a passing grade in this one, Alex. I think I know your answer, but let's just get this elephant. Let's address the elephant in the room and get get out of yes. the way. Stay with Fields. Yes, yes, yes. Same, same with me. I'm not uh, thinking about going back to Wilson. I you, know you can win games with what he's with what he's doing, and 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 uh, assuming that you continue to use his legs, and you know if you can get these these hugely negative plays, so routine things routinely. Uh, if you could get that aspect, uh, uh, removed from, from, from his play, uh, it would obviously have looked even better there, but I mean, you're four games in at this point, have there, have they put up the amount of points that you'd like to see to this point? No, but you know, everything that, that he can do at this point uh, you've seen them enough within the constraints and, and, and what you're trying to get done schematically in this offense. Uh, there are areas still, I think you can build on within what you're w- within his skill set, especially throwing, you know, down the field. Uh, you can win plenty of games, I think with him and, uh, you've got the continuity fact at this point, I think he's a good leader overall. Uh, he doesn't get too high, too low, yada, yada. Uh, and you know, what, what is one of the things that we hope to, to, to see coming out of this season? And yeah, it's only four games old. Don't want to look too far down the road, but man, you really hoped that regardless of how this thing comes out, that maybe one of these two guys 
uh, can can potentially be your franchise quarterback at least the next couple of years moving forward. And I think at this point, uh, obviously sight un- still unseen on on really what Russell Wilson can bring to this thing. But is it worth going that route at this point of going more with the uh, unknown factor than going with the known fact. I mean, because Fields has the ability to, to still deliver you explosive plays, both with his arms, with his arm and with his legs there. So uh, I would have no reason to move away from him at this point. Same. I, I thought he fought hard. I thought he battled. Obviously got this team back into the game and did it without really any sort of consistent run game throughout. Had to create on his own, had two rushing touchdowns. Thought as a passer, you know, once he threw the ball, made good decisions overall in that regard and was able to create some of those big chunk plays Pittsburgh is looking for. So certainly not a perfect perfect performance, certainly a lot to critique and a lot to work on. And that fumble and sack was shades of Chicago and just trying to do too much in, in that moment. But uh, overall, they bounced back and, and he made plays. He found pickings. He, you know, again, got this team in near position to to tie this thing and it didn't happen and didn't finish because of a mistake that, that he takes responsibility for but on the whole i'm not here to uh have a knee-jerk reaction and start changing quarterbacks at the first sign of trouble you know we talked uh this past week you know we get a better sense of uh uh a more sense of justin fields when he got in a situation when having to play from behind uh, and we got to see that in this game, and I, th- I thought he answered the bell. I mean, he, you know, they 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 were answering uh, those scores there, and up until the end, once again, you know, final drive of the game, key key moment, and uh, I I had I had confidence thinking that he was going to at least get them in field goal range. Uh, and obviously, didn't the snap and all like that, but once again, you know, you can't remove these and and say how was the play, Mrs. Lincoln, you know, mm-hmm. uh, but. Largely from what I've seen through four games with him to this point, uh, I, I think he's passed. And I think, once again, I think there are areas uh, that can be built on within the con- what you're trying to do schematically on offense. And you know, we, we got a taste of, of, of more running fields in this game. And uh, now you take into account the shape of the offensive line where he might have to run uh, more. Uh, that just fits more into his wheelhouse overall, I think. So uh, I I will be surprised. And look, we'll see if Mike Tomlin still hides behind. Well, he, Russell Wilson's not healthy or anything like that. But even if, 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 if Russell Wilson is Dean 100% healthy. And I know there was a report pregame by Ian Rappaport saying that the expectation is Wilson will be healthy next week. We'll see. But uh, I, I, I'll i be surprised if uh, Justin Fields is not starting Sunday night against the Dallas Cowboys. Agreed. That is my expectation as things sit here today. We'll hear from Tomlin tomorrow. But I, th- I think that'll be the conversation that we have on Wednesday. Just a bit of non-Steelers breaking news. Sometimes I like to just interject to, to, to mention these things. I'm reading this from Jonathan Jones of CBS Sports. The NBA announces basketball Hall of Famer Dikembe Mutombo has passed away today at the oh. age of 58 from brain cancer. I didn't realize he was sick, and so that is a uh, oh. really unfortunate. Just uh, just wow, that, that, that that's that, sad. That is, yeah, tough to read. So just wanted to pass that information along because it just came across my timeline um, right now. All right, Dave, back to the Steelers here. What this team does need is a run game, and what they're not getting is a run game right now, not a consistent one. At least that it's not fields aided by scrambles and just doing it all with his legs. And so Najee Harris bottled up 13 carries, 19 yards, got a spark from Patterson until he left with the ankle injury. Uh, just really two weeks, aside from that fourth quarter against the Chargers, and I get the difficulty of running on uh, the Chargers and had to wear them down, and they finished strong late, and that was great. But overall, and really throughout the entire season, they have not been an efficient running team. And Arthur Smith, coming into this week, was preaching starting fast with a run game, and they did not start fast with the run game. They really had no lanes. And I know teams are selling out to stop the run. And that's going to be the, you know, the, the top challenge for defenses is making sure Pittsburgh becomes one dimensional and they can't run the ball like they want to, but still you had a really poor, I think running game overall. And that has to change. 
Yeah, they didn't start fast on either side of the football right. <laughs> in, 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 in this one, and definitely not uh, with the running game. And then you get Cordell, uh, Cordero Patterson in the game and start you know from deep in your own end and start getting some spark from that. Then you lose him uh, to injury. Now, uh, they, they were blocking coming out of their own end. They started blocking things up a lot better on that right side. Uh, overall, and and Patterson really was hitting it uh, uh, in a hurry. Uh, they really missed Jalen Warren uh, in in this one. That would have been a nice change uh, of, of, of of pace to add in there. But uh, Najee's having a hard time uh, getting it going early in the games, along with offensive line. They've got to figure this part out of being able to establish that running game because none of their play action stuff seemed to be really biting. You know, uh, in 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 this one either. So uh, then now you you know you've got a really really makeshift offensive line at this point, and you're going to have uh, obviously a couple of rookies involved in that moving forward. They've got to figure out this uh, this early game running game and 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 get it to start getting some teeth. And now you kind of wonder how long you're going to be without Patterson. Uh, I guess there's a report by Kabali this morning that don't expect Warren back anytime soon. So uh, w- w- what's your running back situation going to look look like uh, against the Cowboys uh, Sunday night? Najee and Shamklin and Ward, maybe? Maybe. I can't tell you on Patterson right now. That'll be a name to watch and hear from uh, tomorrow. From Mike Tomlin, but yeah, Aaron Champlin getting his first carry, and it was him and Harris to to finish this one out. Champlin getting some third down work in this one. Um, but yeah, I mean, I thought you know, I'll have to watch the tape. I know post game Najee said the Colts were packed in the box, which they were, which we knew. You know, they were cover three, put eight in the box, stop the run kind of personality on their get Gus Bradley. Harris said they weren't getting hands on guys; they were free runners, and so that always is tough for a run game. You know, Patterson did have more success, felt like he saw more burst and you know, downhill ability from him. But I want to go back and certainly watch the all 22 of this one. I don't know if Patterson kind of his more receiving threat had the Colts playing too high more. I, I just have to watch the tape on that one. I, I did feel like the run game overall was pretty static and not creative. We talked about, you know, on Friday show, some more window dressing, some more eye candy to kind of get the Colts to uh move their eyes and and be a little slower out in space. And I talked about, I thought a a game plan of duo and inside zone, trying to run into the teeth of that defense, even without Buckner was not a good idea. And it did feel like to me, largely first time through, that's what they did. They just kind of ran, tried to barrel straight ahead and they did not have success, especially after losing Daniels early in this game. They were just trying to manhandle them earlier. Just probably it felt like just try to beat a more physical team and boy, the Colts, they showed up ready to play in this one. Their guys were working downhill, uh, getting off blocks and, and really filling and, and not allowing, uh, any, any, it was all just bunched up in the middle. It felt like for the longest time up until Cordell Patterson got into the game, uh, deep in her own, uh, when the Steelers were deep in her own in. And that, that was really the only spark, uh, about what four, three or four runs by Patterson, uh, overall was, was really the only spark uh, outside of Justin Fields, uh, doing some running, thought it was curious on the fourth and one, uh, play. I don't have an issue with them going forward in that situation. Uh, because look, if you can't get one yard in the NFL in a key situation, (laughs) you probably don't deserve to win a game anyway, especially when you're down like that, needs some sort of uh, momentum there. Uh, But on that one snap, it was the one snap of the game that Ryan McCollum played, and they put him in there as a eligible offensive lineman. How many times throughout his career, including college, Alex, do you think Ryan McCollum was an eligible tackle? I'm going to guess zero. I don't. I don't know for sure. I'm guessing here. I'd have to go back and no. actually look. I, I. I don't know, but uh, I'm willing to bet it wasn't many times. And I mean, he's a more of you know, obviously more of a center guard type. Uh, and look, I don't know if the out if the outcome would have been any different. But they had uh, the 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 new offensive lineman Anderson dressed for this game. Uh, would have 
probably been more apt to take my chances if you're going to get in that situation with the eligible guy to put him in. But obviously, he's new to the team, yada, yada. But uh, McCollum doesn't get a hat on anybody. And, you know, the linebacker comes through and just stands, plants fields, you know, uh, and and you turn the football over on downs there. So a little bit curious personnel. Uh, decision in, 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 in that situation, which was obviously a, a quarterback keeper in that one. Yeah. And just watching the old 22 clip you had posted of that play. And it just seems like a, a bad path by McCollum to go that far outside on an interior design run by Justin Fields. I don't know what the leverage is there. I don't know why he's taking that kind of angle. It just kind of, to me, sums up the game. This team felt confused, unsure of themselves, out of place some bad body language. We'll talk about the defense. I think that was probably more evident defensively, but this team just felt a step behind in this game. And, and that play is emblematic of it all. And you can talk about, and I will talk about Tomlin here, I'm sure at some point, not challenging that third down run by Najee. And I, I know that those fourth down calls are so viewed through a lens of results. If it works, great call. If it doesn't, bad call. I don't know. That just, to me, Tomlin's, phrase and mantra is don't make the simple complex it's fourth and half a yard just sneak forward i think we'll get it there with fields not doing this like trap block block at a two back with a tackle eligible where hayward and Najee aren't really blockers on the play it just seems to be too much to, yeah to gain half a yard right right just i mean and up until that point you've been trying to just at least you've been able to do uh uh one yard in a cloud of dust up until that point. Why not one more time? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I know I talked about the need for a creative run game, but there are moments where you just sit there and say, let's get the half yard there. Let's sneak ahead and uh, find the bubble and go forward. And that, to me, should have been uh, the, the call. I, I don't have the issue going forward. I right. think you should have challenged the play before, but okay, put, putting that aside, going for it, I, I get it. Uh, the, the actual design of the call, to me, was just too much going on. Yeah. Uh, and then throwing in once again, personnel, uh, curious decision, put McCollum in the game in that situation. Yeah. It just, and, it, and, it, and Daniels was out at that point, right? Cause Anderson had come in at right guard. So right. What, what last time you think he played right guard and was pulling across in, in a practice, I've probably been a little bit. Right. All right. Um, what else here offensively? Yeah. The run game inconsistent, uh, fields, I thought fought and battled and was, was a gamer in this one, helped get this team back in. Uh, receiver George Pickens, seven catches, 113. How many yards he had? 113. 113 yards. The fumble, just too loose with the football. I think he was trying to maybe like reach Three. out, and there's just no need for that. He even did that after for on a you know not non third down conversion type moment, trying to reach the ball out. So, yeah, two turnovers in this one. Pittsburgh, they're, they're not a team that wins when they can't play clean. They came into this game plus four in turnover differential. Uh, they they lose this one minus two. That's not how Pittsburgh wins. No, they did spread the football around in this one. Uh, no catches for Scotty Miller in this one. A little bit curious that you can't get him involved in this thing. Uh, and look, uh, the, the ball should have went to Pickens a lot in this game, and it did. Uh, the fumble, I mean, that, yeah, that was a key play, play in this game, that fumble, because you're down deep. You know, obviously, in that situation, you can't turn over the football, especially deep down low. So that was uh, a key point in this. You know, I mean, I thought they did a good job of spreading the football around. Uh, there, you know, there was that one swing pass over to the side to 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 Naji to the left that uh, was could have been probably uh, had better accuracy on it. But but once again, rolling back to fields, I. Uh, I, I thought Fields distributed the ball well overall in the passing game. Uh, there would probably been a little bit more T. We knew that this wasn't going to be a, a between the numbers or you know uh, uh, middle of the field passing game overall for the Steelers, and it wasn't. They were going to have to take their shots uh, more outside, and they did. And and they were you know they were able to make hay with that uh, overall. Uh, and then you had you know. Did. The the main one of the main contributions that they had was the catch and run by Najee Harris for 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 a huge yards. What do you have like thirty two yards on that play was a big play in this game. So you know the passing elements I think they can work with and 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 did in this game. And then you once again you mix in the uh, the running ability of Fields. They just the running game outside of about four runs from from Patterson and a couple of uh, uh, scrambles by Fields. 
uh, really left the run game non-existent overall. So, but even so, you got a situation where you're in that final possession. If you go down, you can at, at a minimum tie the game. And what happens then? You know, Jonathan Taylor's dink, dinged up, I think, at that time. And mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> what are the, I, I, I don't, do you have anything else to add pretty much about offense on this? No, just, just I would say a lack of rhythm for this offense. They never got into a groove, even in that comeback. I mean, they did in the second half a bit when they kind of had to, to really lean on fields in the past game, but just overall, it did, they didn't feel fluid offensively. It was just very bumpy, very turbulent in this game, and that's not what Pittsburgh is, is looking for. All right. Um, defensively in this one, how about this for a headline? Joe Flacco off the bench beating the Pittsburgh Steelers. It has a very 2013 kind of feel in this one. And kudos to him. Kudos to the Colts for adjusting. All weekend of Pittsburgh's game plan was on Anthony Richardson and his big playability, his run game ability, and his mistake-prone ability as well. And he exits pretty early in this one, takes a, a shot from Minka Fitzpatrick. And it was a game of missed opportunities defensively to me, Dave, for Pittsburgh's issues and struggles. You drop a pick in the end zone from Porter, first play of the game. Porter probably should have had that as an interception, goes for a 32-yard gain, get a forced fumble on that Minka hit there. Richardson first went down, can't recover that one. Uh, just the game missed opportunities. And then Flacco coming in and carving up Pittsburgh's own defense. I couldn't help but think, and look, Richardson did have a good start to this game, so I don't want to take anything away from him. Uh, uh, made some, you know, made some, connected on some throws uh, early in this game, used his legs and everything like that. But uh, I couldn't help but think uh, late last night into early this morning, uh, the Cardinal sin was knocking Anthony Richardson out of this game because you get a guy, Joe Flacco, that's seen, uh, been around this league a lot, seen a lot of what the Steelers like to do, especially with the with a lot of their zone stuff. And, uh you know, the Steelers weren't good, I don't think, spacing-wise in a lot of this and had some uni- commu- miscommunication on the defensive side of football. But Joe, I don't I don't think Joe Flacco was confused a lot by what the Steelers did. Uh he had he didn't he didn't go, he didn't connect down deep past uh uh 16 yards down the field in this game. I think four uh, of, uh, I think just four of his past completions were greater than uh, nine air yards in this one. And look, he wasn't just beating specifically zone stuff. Uh, he, he had a couple of uh, uh, completions, I think, on a couple of man opportunities over there. And they did not have an answer for Josh Downs whatsoever. Boy, you know, we go by, couldn't help but think going back to the pre draft process and the Steelers being at that pro day and. Uh, down saying that uh, uh, the Steelers told me he had one of his best workouts. And then fast forward, Downs had the ankle issue uh, earlier this summer. He's over that now. They didn't have an answer for for uh, for Downs in this game uh, at all. And then uh, they also didn't have an, 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 an answer for Pittman early on, who I think in the first half, what did, didn't he have like 101 first half? receiving yards Pittman and then I I think they were able to keep him bottled up uh after that uh overall but uh Flacco was not confused by what was going on and we talked uh, going into this uh, uh one key element Ryan Kelly missed uh, one thing that we didn't really overly expect you know we knew it was one thing to watch was maybe Ryan Kelly's uh injury situation but going into Sunday morning I wasn't overly thinking that Ryan Kelly might miss that game, their starting center. Well, he did, and uh, they didn't miss a beat. Uh, that offensive line was real physical and getting it done against the Steelers' defense uh, overall, and they they were manhandling things. They were getting to the second level early in this game, blowing the Steelers off the ball, uh, doing a good job of of, 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 of uh, specifically, I thought, runs to the left side. Uh, the Steelers missing some tackles early on, and uh, once 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 uh, Richardson left and Flacco came into the game, they 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 got even better. And uh, third downs in this game, oh, they com- they hmm. converted eight third downs uh, in this game, and they came in two bunches of four. And 
yo, you would think, okay, they got that first bunch of four right in a row of, of, of third downs, I think, uh, in the first half that they converted. Well, actually, it was their first four third downs of the game, I think, that uh, that they had converted there. And then uh, you, you finally get a lid on that for – for the next several possessions there. And then their, their other four third down conversions were long ones too. Like what? Third and seven, third and seven, third and nine and 10 or something like that. Uh, and the Steelers had no answer for it. And those were back breaking third down conversions uh, right in a row there. I, I think one of them was a touchdown. In fact, there, if you get a stop there, you, you, you hold them obviously to a field goal in that situation there. But uh, the Steelers defense, you know, even though they went through that third quarter and, and looked better for about what, three or four series, I think uh, when it counted most later in the game, they couldn't get the stops when they needed to. As you said, Colts 8 of 15 on third down. They had 10 third downs needing six or more yards. The Colts converted six of them. They were 6 of 10 on third and six plus. And Pittsburgh came into this game as the number one third down defense, allowing overall conversion about 21% of the time on third and six plus. That number was reduced to about 13%, and the Colts were 60% on, we'll call it, third and long in this one. That is not acceptable. That is not the way the Steelers win. That's not the way most teams win in the NFL. I get your point about Richardson going down and the, almost the way you were hurt by that, but I really think that allowed them to really focus on Jonathan Taylor and take him largely out of the game. The Colts had a bunch of success running the ball in that first drive, and I think you know we were trying to pick priorities and split the tension between Richardson and Taylor and the run game element, once he goes out and it's Flacco, that read option does not exactly work the same way. And so I think that really helped them focus in on Taylor and take away the run. They just couldn't stop the pass. And Flacco, like you said, I mean, it wasn't 100% zone, but it was primarily zone. Pittsburgh was playing and Flacco carved it up. Sure did, like he had seen it a hundred times. Mm -hmm. And 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 I I just, I feel like had, I if, if Richardson... I would have, I would have bet. And once again, I don't, I thought Anthony had a good start to the game and all, sure. uh, it, uh, but, uh, the, the, the tape in the first, uh, three games with him is he was going to make some mistakes. You but know, what Pittsburgh capitalized, they didn't capitalize. On right. Right. They had, they, they definitely had opportunity. You know, he had a, you had that first one, yeah. uh, uh, to, to, to Joey that he couldn't, uh, go up and go get. So there's one, uh, Richardson put the ball on the ground. Uh, Patrick Queen couldn't come up with that one there. Uh, and then Joey Porter Jr. made I mean, a fantastic, you know, played, played the cover three situation because that looked like it was going to be a score easy, uh, 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 on, on, you know, at the snap of the football there. But Joey, uh, did a good job and, and, and came off more to, and went to the middle of the field. And, uh, how big would have a red zone, you know, interception been in that situation? So it's not like Joe Flacco didn't give them an opportunity to take them, take the football uh, away, especially in a key uh, area of the field. And, and, and they didn't. And, you know, if you, if you got two of those takeaways, were you know, two of the three opportunities there, you know, how much does that change the overall complexion of the game, regardless of who's in at quarterback on the other side there? Uh, Joe Flacco was not going to uh, 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 probably beat you on down the field, right? Uh, uh, especially when you're playing a lot of zone in this one, trying to keep a lid on it anyway. But he he sure did carve him up, up, up underneath there, uh, and specifically to Josh Downs. Just to give you a stat of the weird here off the top, Flacco has now thrown 27 career regular season touchdowns against Pittsburgh, adding two more in Sunday's game. That is third all time against the Steelers in, in history. You want to guess the two players who are above him who have thrown more touchdown passes against Pittsburgh in history? Well, Brady probably is one of them, yeah. right? Brady is one. The other one is really obscure. I'll just give it to you. Um, Charlie Connerly from the Giants in the oh. 40s, 50s, 60s with 29. So it goes Brady with 30, Connerly 29, Flacco 27. He's also tied with Sonny Jurgensen uh, with 27. So uh, seen, seen too many Flacco touchdowns, and hopefully that's the uh, last one Pittsburgh will ever see.
And look, both those touchdowns were you you I mean you, th- those those were easy ones for Flacco too to downs into uh to Ogle Ogletree. Yeah, the first one they're running a little whip pivot route, expecting man Pittsburgh clay zone, and it's just pitch and catch at that point. I think Flacco said that's one of the easier touchdowns he's he's ever had, and it was. The other one, the Ogle Tree, he chips Watt and Pittsburgh loses him, and he's wide open over the middle. Again, busted coverage. Don't know exactly who and what went wrong on that play, but a guy wide open, too easy pitch and catch there down in the red zone. And one of them was third down at least. What what was the one uh were, were they both? What was the downs on, on both of those? Uh, the one to downs was third and four from the four. Uh, what was the ogle tree one? Third and ten. All right. So th- once again, it plays back into the third down yep. uh, aspect. So so two third down uh, and and, uh, uh, and a long third down in one of them. Right. All right. So you know you hate to boil it down to just a couple of plays, but. Usually you can circle about six, seven, eight plays in a game being the difference, uh, especially in one score games. And those definitely were. And then you missed the take. You had three golden opportunities to take the football away and didn't do it. And the defense just couldn't get some of those stops because the offense was coming alive and fighting back. I mean, they were getting back to one score games. They were down with 17, nothing made it 17, 10. Colts went up 24-10. Pittsburgh made it 24-17. Colts got a field goal, made it 27-17. So you just wanted that one defensive stop. Right. We did get it late, and of course, Pittsburgh did have a chance to get in field goal range, but we're looking for one earlier than kind of last second uh, in this game. I thought Porter had a really poor game overall. They picked on him. They weren't scared to go after him. They were really Especially going... Especially a man, yeah. Yeah, they were really going after Pittman on first down, and I think Pittman had like three catches of 20 plus yards on first down and this one including the first play of the game for 32 yards and so I thought Dante Jackson was the better corner overall in this one he had a nice game I thought Sean Elliott played well too Porter though tough one for him yeah defensively uh, especially first half too many too many missed tackles I, I thought overall not getting off blocks in a run game and uh, then obviously not taking taking advantage of the opportunities to take the football away, and then you just keep circling back to third downs in this game and how key yeah. they were, especially those those that final group of four of them. I promise during Tomlin's press conference tomorrow, you're going to hear weighty downs and third downs referenced by him a ton in this one. I thought Pittsburgh that was one of their biggest issues in this game for all the reasons we mentioned. Mm-hmm. I would agree. And like a pass rush too, and really not a lot of pressure on Flacco. Um, how many sacks that Pittsburgh had? They did have two. Uh, got some interior push with Hayward, Ogan Joby. But I thought the Colts had a great game plan against Watt. Really took him away consistently. He was a non-factor in this one. He had two tackles, no quarterback hits, of course, no sacks. So sitting on ninety-nine and a half for his career, Colts would not let him get to that triple-digit mark. Uh, I thought Herbeck had a bit of pressure, but but not a ton in this one. Uh, and the pass rush overall really was was pretty weak. Yeah, uh, I think T.J. Watt officially came out of this game with two total tackles, and both of those were credited as assisted tackles. Uh, yeah. So they 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 definitely did a number on him. Uh, what are you, uh, you know, obviously some key of officiating calls in this one? The uh, the unnecessary roughness on Minka. Yeah, that's just a brutal call. I mean, that is to me clean. It, that is really the opposite. I, I don't of the know penalty. what you want him to do in that situation. I mean, the, you got a guy coming, coming ninety miles an hour, and you're you're trying your best not to not to end the guy's career on the other end who had led up on the play, and two bodies are going to collide uh, in that situation. If he if 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 Minka just just tries to dive low in that situation, you're probably still going to get a call because you're going low on a guy uh, in 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 that situation. I mean, it it just is it's an unfortunate bang bang. Uh, you you just you can't stop on a dime in that situation, and it's you know it's not like he tried to you know bury him in that situation either. It's just the two guys colliding and and very uh, you know. Uh, that's but, a call but, that shouldn't have gone against the Steelers. I don't think. 
Yeah, I don't even think it's one of those, well, you know, what do you want the guy to do? Yeah, it was helmet to helmet contact, but they're going fast. Like that that still gets called regardless of but 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 it wasn't that. It was shoulder to shoulder contact. Like it was clean in terms of how he hit him. So it wasn't even like this intent kind of discussion and just, you know, what do you want to ask the DB to do? It was just, it was to me textbook it was the opposite of a penalty it was how it should be played right. where you hit shoulder to shoulder to me there was not contact with the helmet it was clean across the board i mean it looked bad i know because mitchell's pulling up there at the end and Mika still pulled up a bit like you said to me that was a not a penalty because it wasn't a penalty because there was no forcible contact to mitchell's helmet by Minka's shoulder or his helmet or anything like that he led with the shoulder connected shoulder to shoulder that was clean 100%. That's how the NFL wants it to be. Yeah, I'll be surprised if he uh, gets fined for this, but I've been, I've been, so, so, you know, I, I've thought that before and it's gone opposite. Can we also just take a quick uh, detour to talk about that Darnell Washington fine on the illegal crackback for a block? I, I'm they, still they had struggling. They had to get that wrong. They had to get the wrong plug. But I mean, that's that. Yeah. Uh, look, don't don't shoot the messenger. <laughs> a lot of people, you know, were were kind of coming after me. I, I'm just passing along. Yeah, you didn't you didn't find them. <laughs> uh, I'm just passing along when when they listed the play is happening. Uh, by the way, that Minka penalty came on a second and ten from the from the Colts, forty two, and obviously was an incomplete pass. So that would have set up a third and two. With uh, 132 left in the third quarter, so Flacco would have had to throw the football down the field again uh, in, 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 in that situation. But instead, it ended up being, what, first and 10 at the Steelers' 43, and then they go on to get a touchdown uh, a few plays later in that drive. But, uh, yeah, yeah the, uh, I, I don't understand that fine. There, I don't want to get in the weeds about this because I know no one, no one cares coming off the loss. But there is some provision about illegal crackbacks in terms of going low on guys. But I think that's more about if you're like blindsiding the guy or coming back towards your line of scrimmage. And I don't know how a backside cutoff block turns into a legal crackback at all. But, but yeah, very, very strange. They are talking about just weird officiating in this one. I know he's appealing. Washington is, and we'll see what the result is. Maybe we'll find out at some point along the way. Let me let me give you a, a a hidden error in this game that I think was really really costly that no one's going to talk about or remember. It was second and ten, end of the third quarter. Colts have the ball at their own thirty. Flacco drops back. Cam Hayward seemingly has the sack. I mean, he's engulfed the immobile Joe mm. Flacco, and Flacco somehow gets out of it enough to throw the ball away. It goes down incomplete as opposed to say a six yard loss. So now it's third and 10 and Flacco hits Michael Pittman for 12 yards. The drive gets going. They result in that touchdown to Drew Ogletree uh, to, to you know, put the Colts ahead there. Man, if you get that sack, it's third and 16. Good chance they're going to punt there and you're right back in this thing. So Hayward's got to finish that play. I mean, if, if it was Richardson, that's one thing because it's a big, strong dude that's tough to take down. Still got to finish, but OK, I can kind of get that. It's Joe Flacco. You got to right. get this guy down. Yeah, you're right. You're right. That 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 will be kind of swept underneath the carpet. Yeah. So that was uh, you know, disappointing there overall. Any other thoughts in this game defensively, Dave? Uh, not without watching more of the all twenty two and all to kind of see. I haven't even cracked open that side yet. I went. I mean, I, I did one or two plays to watch to see what happened with Porter in the end zone on that missed interception. I watched. Uh, uh, a couple of the sacks and all, but I haven't, I haven't, uh, haven't gone deep in the all 22, but we'll talk more about that on Wednesday after going through it. Uh, what do you think of the play of the tackles? So what what do you have as far as blitzes in this one in, in the charting? Uh, I have not put it into my spreadsheet yet. Just charting on paper, not a ton. And again, some of those were the hug green dog blitzes where the back stays in linebackers rush, uh, not, not much in the form of blitzing. I'd probably say around fifteen percent. I had to guess, and especially with Flacco in there, they they just they didn't want him to die. They they probably knew that they probably weren't going to fool him in some of those situations. Yeah, when you're struggling in zone and you're not in, in leaving big voids, and I think blitzing can hurt you more when you're struggling to kind of get basic landmarks down. What do you think of the tackle play? Just go back to offense here quickly. I thought Dan Moore had his issues in pass pro. Broderick Jones looked okay at right tackle, but I'll have to, to do a deeper dive, obviously. 
Yeah, I haven't haven't specifically broken either, either one of those guys down. But, I mean, as, as a whole, the offensive line wasn't good enough. Mm-hmm. Edmonds, defensively, he did play in dime packages. So that's why he got the helmet. It was weird to see the 38 out there. Had to do a double take and go, who was that 38? That was Terrell Edmonds. So the eight snaps you referenced earlier all came in dime. Um, yeah, with Herbig, missed some time. Luckily, he came back. Pittsburgh would have been in a real bind had Herbig been unable to return and been left to down to two outside linebackers in, in Leal, the, the hybrid guy, and, and TJ Watt. Um, my other charting, pretty unremarkable, but a lack of pressure was was a clear thing where Pittsburgh was not getting after the quarterback. Absolutely. All right, Dave, any thoughts on special teams? Boswell, a 50-yarder, his, what, fifth 50-yarder of the year. Um, Waitman did have one, one shank. But um, special teams, I guess, overall pretty inoffensive. A nice punt return by Calvin Austin, unfortunately squandered by mm. what ended up being that field sack fumble that put the ball back in in, in, in uh, Pittsburgh's territory. Yeah, a golden opportunity you blew in that situation for sure. Let's talk Mike Tomlin here, Dave. I thought a really poor game for him and kind of reflective of the poor performance of the players. Some weird ones in this one. I just kind of want to run through the things I took issue with and you had more more commentary about his coaching performance and I usually do with a head coach uh, in this game. The lack of challenge on the Najee Harris third down run late in the first quarter. What did you think of the, the non-challenge from Tomlin? Well, I, hey, let's start with the that one that he did challenge uh, that looked very, very clear. I don't know the, the catch who was at downs over there. Mm-hmm. Uh I, I thought that was silly to to do that one. Uh, the not what are you talking about? The non challenge on the Najee? Yes, yes. Late in the I wanted to go chronologically. Late in the first quarter, third and two before the failed fourth and one. The line to gain is the forty. It looked like Najee had gotten there, but they called him about a half yard short. I haven't gone back to look at that specifically to see the spot on that one. I mean, it's a little hard to tell. I'll give you that. I'm not going to pretend it was a slam dunk. 100% going to win that one. And I know Tomlin's philosophy on spot, you know, challenges is it has to be some clear visual. But to me, that 40 yard line is a clear visual. If you're trying to judge 32 or 33, okay, that can be tough. I get not challenging that, even if you think he's made it. But you're at the 40. I can clearly see Najee. I can clearly see the football. I can clearly see the line to gain. I think that was certainly worth a challenge. Okay, I mean he he'll he'll, he'll challenge a more uh, he'll challenge one like the one with with uh, with the the pass to downs, but he won't challenge something like that in the key situation of the game. Yeah, and that was keep, my next keep, keep you out of being in the fourth and one situation there. Right, right, and that was my next point. Challenging four plays later, the Josh Downs catch on third and six, which. At first, I thought they were challenging. Did he get the first down? Which I th- even thought that was pretty debatable. But on replay, it was a clear catch by Downs. Oh, and a good angle of it too. You would think whoever's up there, if he's getting mm-hmm. any help whatsoever, is going to say, "Hey, yeah, you know, uh, no, no need there." Yeah, and I, and I know that Tomlin's not looking at a monitor. He's getting intel in his headset about, "Hey, challenge this." So I know it's not maybe his. It's his decision, but it's not necessarily his information. He's he's trusting who's ever in the booth aiding him in that. But you know, regardless, a terrible challenge, just a horrible, just burn that time out. You know, for no good reason. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I thought at the end of the first half, it's seventeen nothing Colts ahead. Pittsburgh has one timeout, forty one seconds left on the Colts forty four. They run an RPO, ends up being a five yard run by Aaron Shamklin. Not loving that play call to run the ball with one timeout down 17, basically trying to get in the field goal range. Yeah, and how many times have we felt like uh, they're 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 just playing give up? Uh, what what to just get a field goal? Yeah, through, I mean, through, I through the first four games. I mean, I I can get that in some moments in the Falcons game, for example, that first first drive of the season. It's third. Was that Shamsklin's first touch too? It was. Yeah, it was only the only touch. Of yeah. The game. Yeah, uh, it was an RPO. I mean, it was an RPO, but still, yeah, to run so there five yards. you're going to do that yards. with 40-something seconds left in, <laughs> yeah, some of the curious personnel and 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 play calls at, at timely timely points in the game. Yeah, so they run the ball. They do get five, but the clock runs. They don't burn a timeout. Field sack on the next play. They have to use a timeout, and so they end up netting two yards. They lose about 20 seconds in their final timeout. They do get a field goal in the end, but 
you know, I get in the Falcons game, that first drive, you know, you're playing for the field goal, make it 3-3. Okay, I, I, I get that. This You're down 17 nothing. You need points. We need points in a hurry. I know they're getting the ball at half. It's maybe they saw we'll kick a field goal, get the ball at half, go down and score. But you're down big. Let's not play for three when you're down 17 in this game. Here's a really weird, weird one that, again, people will forget about. It's the fourth quarter. Colts are up 24-17, about six minutes left in the game. Pittsburgh stuffs the Colts on third down. It's fourth and five from Pittsburgh, 16. Indy coming out the kick. Mike Tomlin calls his first timeout of the half. I don't know why he called a timeout there. What was the time stamp on that? About six minutes left in the fourth quarter, right after, right before the Colts went ahead 27-17. to 17. Pittsburgh gets a stuff. They, they tackle Trey Sermon for a two-yard loss. It's fourth and five. From Pittsburgh 16, Flacco's walking off, kicking teams coming out. And this was a quick timeout. This was less than 10 seconds from the time that the third down play ended to when the ref announced uh, Pittsburgh had used their first timeout of the half. So it wasn't like they lined up for a field goal and Pittsburgh had 12 men or there was some mass confusion. Maybe there's a valid reason. I, I assume there is something happening. But why burn a timeout there when you're about to go down two scores with six minutes left, knowing that if you get back into this game, you're going to need all the timeouts that you have. And it's a short field goal. It's a gimme on top of it. And they're only going to run her off X amount of seconds in there anyway. Yeah. So I don't, I don't know. I don't know what the, I don't, and to me, I don't think it was an injury and there would have been injury timeout for that, I assume. So I, I don't know why you end up burning your first timeout in that moment. You don't think that maybe he thought they were because they weren't because Flacco was walking off, right? Yeah, and they're they're, they're going to kick the field goal. They're going to go up 27-17, go up two scores with six minutes left. It'd be insane to go for it on fourth and five in that situation. So I have no idea what the calculation mm. is there. Yeah. And then finally, the no timeout on that last possession. So I guess it really didn't matter that he called a timeout because he, he took one with them. Um, you know, I, I know that you're trying to save that last timeout for if you need a last second you know timeout there to, to get off a field goal. but I think in all the chaos, there's still of that, plenty of time, and you're working. You know, at worst, you're you're not far from Boswell range in that situation. Well, I just think it was just too chaotic after the the the, the snap issue. You know, you're getting the second and twenty two. You're trying to call plays in quickly. Clock's running, and then on that third down completion to Harris, where he goes backwards, and so the clock keeps running. I think you got to use a timeout there. It's fourth and ten. The game's you on reset. the line. You got to make sure yeah. you got the right call in there yes. for what could potentially be the final play of the game, but yet, yeah. Uh, and, and once again, you, you know, you, there was still, you could have got past that with no timeouts. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's just, you got to settle things down, get your best play call in because saving that timeout for a Boswell field goal is not going to matter if you don't convert here on fourth and 10, like right. first, first things first is get the first down, keep this game going. We'll deal with, you know, the lack of timeout with time running out, you know, later, but we have to convert here on fourth and 10. Instead, you're trying to get everyone back and trying to get the call in quickly. And, uh, you know, just it, it was too rushed and Pittsburgh needed to, to breathe for a second with all the chaos after that snap. They, they never got to settle back in and, and it cost them. Yep. Yep. So to me, a really poor game from the way that Mike Tomlin called it and and not to put it all on him. And this is not to say that he should be fired. Obviously, I'm not saying that. It just matter of factly, the decision making consistently, I thought was really, really poor to questionable at best. All right. They definitely let one. <clears throat> this was a winnable game as bad as, you know, uh, uh all the shoot shooting themselves in the foot and all they they still were in a uh, situation to win this game and uh once again i i think it comes down to uh, you had three opportunities to take the football away in this game you didn't you got zero of them and the couple of negative plays that you uh hugely negative plays that you had in this game were were just doubly negative you know we talk about uh uh, stealing and getting, you know, uh, double explosive runs and, and those kind of things and how pack impactful those are, man, when you have negative plays and, and they're, they're kind of doubled either by a, you know, turnover in the field situation or the snap situation, which, which we well, obviously seen way too much of that. Uh, those th that's more than enough to change, change the outcome of the game. You're right. I know we've been negative, and listen, when you lose, you're going to talk about the bad things. When you win, you focus on the good things. Primarily, there was still some good in this game. I, Despite all the 
negativity that I'm coming off with. I'm not panicking over this loss. See, it sucks that no. you lost. You should have won this game. It's unfortunate. Pittsburgh deserved to lose. They did not play well enough to win. You said they still had a chance to come back and at least tie it. So there's still something to be taken from all the issues they had in this game. But you're three and one. Uh, I, I, I'm confident in fields. I'm still confident in this defense. Got a big test on Sunday night against Dallas. And so that'll be huge, of course. But, you know, you had to play three or first four on the road. You won two of them. You won your home, home opener, beat a good Chargers team. I know they were hurting, but you still won. Um, I'm not hitting the panic button here. No, 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 me either. Now, there are obviously concerns on the offensive line, but I think they can can work through that. Uh, they obviously offensively need to get this running game, figure out what it's going to take to have faster starts where where that's concerned. Uh, <clears throat> but look, even, you know, go back to my prediction there. I had them had them dropping the game to the Chargers and winning the game against the Colts. I, I, I think I had them going three and one through the first four games. They're still at that same point. Uh, yeah, they've had some injuries and all, especially on the offensive line. Uh, you got some dinged up running backs at this time, but they, they could be in a lot worse position position. And I'm not, I'm not, the defense will will bounce back from this. I have a feeling. I, I'm I'm not concerned. It's just one, you know, one one game in there, and and even so, you can boil those down to those uh to 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 third down situations and not taking there. You know, you presented yourself opportunities to take the football away on defense. You just you just weren't able to do it. So mm -hmm. no, uh, there 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 is no reason to panic. I mean, obviously, you don't like a loss. You don't like certain aspects of this loss that are easy to. Uh, to uh, to pick through, which we have uh, done that in this one, and yeah, your head coach uh, from a you know time management timeout standpoint didn't didn't call a great game. You had some questionable personnel decisions in this. You had some miscommunication going on on the defensive side of football, but no, it's it's not time to panic. But it is important though. You got a pretty interesting gauntlet coming up here, right? You got a Sunday night game. Uh, against the Cowboys, of albeit at home, you've got a late afternoon game out in Vegas, I believe, and then you have uh, a Sunday night game at home and a Monday night game at home, and uh, prime time, a chance to show uh, what you really are as a team. So, you know, perfect opportunity to bounce back after having a bad taste in your in in in, in your mouth. Yeah, the bounce back opportunity is right there. The, the biggest worry is, like you said, the O line and the injuries and the mounting effects of that. Um, at least you will hopefully get Samalu back, and hopefully the injuries can stop. But but that is the biggest, I think, long term concern for this team right now. But in terms of the strength of the defense and the play of fields, um, you know, I'm not wavering based off of one game. These things happen, not to excuse them and not to, you know. Uh, sweep under the rug the problems in this game we talked about them at length but um not, not always going to be perfect you're going to have a loss and as you said if you had told me before the season began dave you're three and one after the first four games your first place in the north i'm taking that yeah i absolutely and you know we knew that this team's got to make hay in the first half of the season and so far they have i mean yeah uh, now it is important these next you know you gotta gotta come out of these uh, uh by the bye week it feels like with with just really two at most three losses, obviously. But I mean, these should be winnable games coming up for this team. Yeah, I think certainly they're they're clearly winnable for Pittsburgh, but Dallas will be a good test and they're going to be hurting as well. Not expected to have, uh, definitely won't have the Marcus Lawrence and don't think they'll have Michael Parsons in this game. All right, Dave, any other final thoughts? If not, we can get us some re reader emails and close out today's show. All right, let's see if the Cs are angry. I bet they today. are. And by the way, a live, live stream tonight where I'm sure the Cs will continue to kick up waves on our boat. All right, Russell Mocha writes in, uh, the Steelers were very fortunate to have a chance to win this game at the end. If Richardson and Taylor stay healthy, this game might have been a blowout. Uh, the Steelers had no answers to stop the run game until Richardson went down uh, and they could focus solely on Taylor. What is going on with the Steelers run game? How does the old running back Cordell Patterson, uh, how does the old running back Cordell Patterson will look better than Najee Harris? I think this is his last season with us. Something does not seem right with him. Look, they did not sign Najee to, to an extension, so there's no reason to think at this point that uh, Najee Harris will be in Pittsburgh uh, past this season. Uh, we, we've addressed several of these other things. Look, I, I, 
I, I got to be honest, I, and, and I know it would have changed how they attacked the run game, like Alex said, and focusing more on Taylor and yada, yada. I, I, I still feel like I would have wanted to take my chances with Richardson, maybe lollipopping a few uh, to you in there. But, I mean, obviously it played out the way it played out. Uh, the defense did not hold up uh, their end of the bargain, and no, they did not you know, before Richardson and Taylor uh, uh, went out respectively. They they. You know, Richardson, like I said, he wasn't in there long, but he was he was playing well to start with uh, overall. I just remember two two things I wanted to talk about briefly. I don't want to dwell on them, but post game, some of the Twitter happenings reminded me from the Harris comment. Uh, Colts linebacker Zaire Franklin, he was jokingly but saying he wanted to snatch some terrible towels before the game. Uh, went on Twitter and, and called Najee soft. Said after the game, the kid is soft and eighty four runs harder, and so that's his evaluation of of this performance and Broderick Jones after the loss took to Twitter and clapped back at many of Steeler fans who were critical of his performance in this one. I get the frustration for Jones. I'm sure it's been a sea of negativity on his timeline, social media accounts for the last six weeks. Um, but tweeting through it is, is not the right approach there. Broderick. Yeah. Look at people just, I, right, you know, people are just going to be downright nasty in those situations and, and, and tweet what they want to tweet. And it, it's going to happen. Uh, regardless, it, you just got to you just gotta turn your head and not look at that stuff. Yeah, but he did, and his comments were out there. I don't know if he deleted anything, but uh, it was out there, and yeah, not 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 the right approach there, brother. All right, Jalen Brown writes in, hope uh, I caught you before the show is done for Monday. The old line is pissing me off. Uh, I emailed a month ago or so and expressed how we have the same issue over and over again for the last two or three years with Myers' system taking guys eight to nine weeks to gel with it and uh, finally look uh, cohesive. And that's looking to be the same case again with the hopes of the gel coming. When do the chickens come home to roost on Meyer's system? It does more harm than good. Additionally, I don't want Mason playing left guard, regardless of the college snap discrepancies, because it's what has hindered Broderick with playing out of place. And if he's your right guard for 2025, why not just start him there now? So uh, he says, thanks. Hope your health as well. Uh, Dave and Alex and, and, and uh, Alex is still the bachelor of Pittsburgh. How do you feel about uh, how this uh, guard situation should go now? And look, I mean, uh, My Myers, it, Pat Myers isn't going anywhere. Not right now. No, um, I think the old line has a, a it has been battered by injuries. They've not experienced the last two years. I know that's going to create more issues with, with gelling and consistency and continuity, obviously. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't have a real preference. I mean, I, you know, your idea of moving say Malu over, I'm generally hesitant to start moving multiple people to fix one spot, but I get your thought on that. I would prefer McCormick to start over Anderson. I think without watching this Colts tape yet, by the way, I've not seen McCormick through his first uh, full start on the all 22. And I don't want to move McCormick over because he's not really gotten work at right guard. So I guess I'm kind of ending up leaning in your direction of putting say Malu at right guard. Um, I don't know if there's a clear right answer. I don't know if there's a clear wrong answer in this one. I'm kind of open ended and open minded in terms of how they replace James Daniels. It's just to say that, Daniels has not missed a single snap since becoming a Steeler uh, ahead of the 2022 season. And so just replacing that in itself is going to be pretty unusual, pretty foreign, and certainly a big loss. All right, look, uh, uh, it should be McCormick in there instead of Anderson, regardless of the side, right? That is where I'm at before watching back the Colts game. Yeah. All right. And and my only contention is, is more of a logical one sure. from the McCormick standpoint. Agree. So 30, I get, I get 30, that. 3,300 snaps at left guard, 19 at right guard, not saying that he can't go over to the right guard and flourish. And, and look, say Amalo for, for the time that he's been in the league is primarily, I think been a left guard, but he did play, I think almost like one full season at right guard, uh, is say Amalo a better left guard than he is a right guard. Probably. Yes. Uh, so you have that to think about as well too. And then you could go from the aspect. Well, uh, What's going to, you know, what's this thing going to look like, like the, like the emailer says here, you know, are you going to get to a point where, or, or what's going to be the byproduct of what you do now? Will that 
end up carrying over to next year? Well, very well good. I mean, you could get a situation, I suppose, where it's McCormick at left guard and say a Malo right guard next next year. Mm-hmm. You could you could say that you're getting ahead of it that aspect. It's just my you know. And look, this team doesn't care anything about sides. That's why Clearly. I joked joked earlier uh, uh, in the podcast about that. But my un- initial gut feel for this would be you have a rookie in McCormick, keep him on a side that he's more accustomed to, and then it's not like, say, Amalo hasn't played on the right side, you know, and and – you know, that that's the way I think I would go, but uh, that that in, in no way, shape or form means the Steelers will go that way. Yeah, you framed it well. I mean, you could sit there and say that, well, you know, next year you could have say Malu at right guard, McCormick at left guard. And so we're getting ahead of it in that regard. Uh, that makes sense. Uh, again, I'm not I'm not going to probably critique this team too much, depending on what they do, given that there's no clear preferable op- preferable preferable option unless Anderson were to start. And even then I could kind of get Anderson starting, but uh, I don't know. We'll see what Tomlin says tomorrow. All right. Uh, Randy in North Carolina. Hey guys, I really enjoyed the guest conversations you have on the show. Thanks for doing that all season. My question is about what coverages the Steelers were using during the Colts game. I know they play a lot of cover three to stop the run, but when Anthony Richardson was out of, of, of the game, did they switch to playing more man schemes like cover one or cover one rat? There was some buzz in there. I know, uh, I think some cover three buzz. Uh, there was a little bit of, of, of cover one, I think, in there. I have not, we, I have not charted that far. Have you charted that far to, to see what the coverages were after, after Flacco got in the game? No, I've not even seen the all 22 defensively and we don't technically chart all the coverages. Um, it, it still felt very zone heavy overall. So that's my overall takeaway but I'll have to go back and give you a better answer for Wednesday. I, I, I don't think there was a dramatic difference in terms of the coverages they played with Richardson versus, versus uh, when Flacco was in there. It didn't feel like to me uh, that there was a huge shift within that. Uh, he says, how did Michael Pittman Jr. and Josh D- Downs get so wide open against the Steelers? They were finding those holes. They, uh, they, 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 they knew – uh, and Flacco knew right where they're going to be in those situations. And Downs had a Pittman had a great first half. Downs had a great game. Yeah, like Lad McConkey, that that shifty slot receiver over the middle hurt you. And this time they were able to get more of that throughout the game than what the Chargers got after Herbert went down. Yeah, just just poor zone defense. Um, a lot of frustration for Patrick Queen. He was visibly upset in this one. Um, some pretty you know negative body language overall. But yeah, just. You know, but the Colts, we, we said it, the Colts had the deepest group of skill guys at receiver that Pittsburgh has faced the entire season by far. Uh, Pierce, of uh, Pittman, of uh, Downs, of A.D. Mitchell, and Pittsburgh had trouble matching all that. Uh, Dan Devlin writes in, good afternoon. Well, three and one is a good place to be, but the Steelers appeared to hit the snooze a few extra times on Sunday. Would like your thoughts. Number one, I do not focus on JPJ. Uh, but he seemed to step slow for the first drive and throughout. What are your thoughts? Hey, I don't think uh, overall, you know, look, you had two opportunities to take the football away and you didn't. And a couple other times he was beating some man situations. I don't think he had a great game overall. I think you, I think we already knocked that out and established that, right? Yeah, pretty poor game for Porter. Uh, number two, the running game came along, ca- came along, but came along very slowly. Did Dan Moore struggle for the first time this year? I have not concentrated on Dan Moore's uh, uh, game. I've, I've watched like four, 14 plays combined on all 22 on uh, both sides of the ball. So I'm going to have to go deeper in to see, look, the offensive line left to right, just what was it consistently good enough. There were, there were highlights within there. Broderick Jones had a couple of good blocks. Uh, I thought in this game, I thought on a couple of those runs, uh, once uh, Patterson uh, got in the game, I thought the right side of the offensive line uh, uh, did a good job. Uh, but yeah, the running game came along very slowly. And when it did come along for about four or five plays, then, then Patterson left injured. Uh, number three, can you explain in the grasp and an intentional ground grounding? I do not clearly do not understand if Cam tossed Flacco to the ground, would he have drawn a flag? Yeah, that's one of the uh, uh, things that a- Alex just highlighted uh, uh, there was you, you just you got to find a way to get Flacco down to the ground in that situation, period. Yeah, there's a judgment call. Them. Right. There's a judgment call in terms of um 
Is it in the grasp or in the grass? I never never looked up grasp. The, the grasp. It's grasp. Okay, that's what I thought, but I've always been unsure of that. Uh, yeah, there, there's a line there for for the ref to make that call. I think hey, we just got to finish that play, and that's ultimately what it comes down to. I do want to see on that field sack fumble, that 20 yard loss, that disaster of a play. You know what happened on that one? It, people blame Broderick Jones. I don't blame Broderick Jones. It's you know, slide protection, take an inside threat. He's fine. But there were two free rushers. Why did Harris go out? Why is there no hot? I, I want to go back and watch that play because if there's one free rusher, the ball's got to be hot. Should not be two free rushers. The back should not be coming out against that blitz there by by the Colts. Uh, okay, let's move on to Craig. Right, saying. A plus 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 analysis all year uh, around. I look forward to your shows all week. The Steelers sure like to keep us on edge in every game. Ain't that the truth? A uh, couple of questions. I realized that we had a bad wide receiver situation, but I did not realize that it was that bad. Where is Van Jefferson? I know he's not a wide receiver too, but he should be able to get three to four catches a game. It seems that other than Pickens, literally not a single person is ever open. Uh, is it scheme? He asked. I mean, all these wide receivers or NFL caliber. Uh, they should be able to get open two to three times a game, bare minimum. What is happening? Also, I know we aren't going to replace Pat Meyer, but I have to say that he's not doing a good job, whether his techniques are uh, they are bad or he's bad at teaching them. We should be able to run for one yard on fourth and one without doing a quarterback sneak. Yeah, we mentioned you're much better than bringing in a, 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 a center guard in as a tackle eligible and trying to get all funky on fourth and one. Not Why not just sneak that thing in, as Alex, as Alex said uh, earlier there. We've, uh, we're have we going to address Pat Meyer, I'm sure, the rest of the season, and we're going to address the uh, extra wide, wide, you know, the, the, the number two wide receiver uh, position. Uh, look, the, they were still able to distribute the football. You know, say what you will about the wide receiver group, but uh, overall, I, I didn't think the wide receiver group played bad. Yeah, there was nothing, I guess, glaring. It just could they get open more. We'll have to check the tape on some of those things. Jefferson with a couple of catches. But listen, like Jefferson was never going to be a number two receiver, ideally, you know, for this offense. And I wasn't expecting a whole lot out of him this year. thought Austin had a nice catch, I think, on a third down, 17-yard game, taking a pop. I think he's played well the last two weeks. Um, this team obviously could use another, you know, bona fide starting receiver and that conversation is not going to change throughout the rest of the season i don't think uh let's see if i can get squeeze one more in here uh analytics uh i was want this is from andreas i was wondering if you know where i could find analytics on tomlin's win loss record as favorite versus dog uh also do you think uh, he should have gone for two when they were trailing 24 to 10 in the fourth quarter. Ultimately, it didn't matter, but analytics says uh, you should have. All right. What do you think about that? Uh, to answer the first question, you can go on Pro Football Reference Stat Head. You don't think you can find it specifically for Tomlin, but of course, you can just search Steelers since 2007 and look at, you know, favored betting lines and those things, and you can look it up that way. Uh, I know there's a new age philosophy on analytics and going for two earlier. I This is partially my ignorance. I don't fully understand it. I probably have to research it more to understand the rationale, but I really am not in favor of that and was not in favor of Tomlin uh, going for two in that situation you referenced. Uh, let's see here. I think that's got most of it out of the way. Uh, Alex, anything else to add before we get out of here? No, I think we're good. We'll have our live stream tonight. Come back Wednesday, hear from Tomlin, get an injury update and get ready for Dallas. All right. Uh, in the meantime, you can follow me on Twitter slash X at Steeders Depot. Follow Alex Kazora at Alex underscore Kazora. Follow the show at Terrible Podcast. Email the show, the Terrible Podcast at gmail.com. If you like what we do and want to donate, SteedersDepot.com, hit the donate button. Also, if you like an ad free version of the site, SteedersDepot.com, hit the ad free button. Follow the directions that way and log in. Uh, with your username and password. Uh, in the meantime, Alex and I will pour over the All-22. Uh, we will cover the Mike Tomlin press conference on Tuesday. We'll recap all of that uh, on the Wednesday show. So, uh, as always, thanks for listening to the Terrible Podcast with Dave and Alex.